My favorite Shakespeare play is、uh, Coriolanus. But when I'm asked, I usually say Othello, just to see how people react. Normally they say something along the lines of, oh, because, like, Othello was an immigrant, and you're also, like, an immigrant. <laughs> and usually I interrupt saying, you know, I'm not like an immigrant, I am. And they say, oh, no, no well, yes, but what I meant, I, I, that, I meant that you're like Othello, because, like, You know, and I say, because I'm not white. Yeah, I get it. I get it. <laughs> so I guess I have a bit of a sadistic streak on that count. Or maybe I'm just curious about this aspect of Othello that everyone immediately focuses on the race. Now, we happen to live in a backwards and ridiculous time where everyone apparently wants to focus on race. And Othello, as a text, you know, doesn't disinvite it, it does make it a primary. Topic, but to me, it's not a, a text about race. It's just a motif, but it's not the main theme, so to speak. It's not what ties it all together.、Uh, in fact, it's not even a text about Othello. He's not, he's not even the thing that ties it all together. The real protagonist of that play is Iago. And you can tell because he's in every scene except for one. Actually, technically two, but the other scene is like five seconds of a herald in the street saying, Hey, there's a party at Othello's, everyone invited. And that's the whole scene. So it's not, it's not a scene at all. So if we disqualify that, there's, there is only one scene without Iago in it. And that's the scene with the antagonist of the play, Iago's wife. And she's talking to the main heroine of the play, who is Othello's wife. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that Iago is the hero of the play. He's very much the villain, but. He is also the protagonist. Now, I do think it is necessary, if not just straight up interesting, to read Othello as a text about the outsider, about someone who doesn't have really a place in this society, but who has found his place all the same and carved his place there.、Um, and no analysis really can not wrestle with the fact of his skin color and the fact of his moorness in Venetian society. Um, and how people treat him because of that, whether it's for the better or for the worse, or if they completely disregard it the way the Duke of Venice seems to do. Recently, I was watching an analysis、uh, from Andrew Claven about the three Moors in Shakespeare, the three black characters in Shakespeare's plays. The first is from Titus Andronicus, and he's clearly like this outrageous racial stereotype, clearly a young Shakespeare, very misguided attempt in writing a black character. And Claven points that out very succinctly. There's also another Moor in Merchants of Venice, and he's much、uh, further along than that initial foray <laughs> into, <laughs> into、uh, black characters. And he plays with this idea of deceiving appearances, right? How, how appearances do not tell you the full story of a person.、Um, and that becomes very much paramount in, in Othello. Merchant of Venice, by the way. Maybe I should say Venezia. <laughs> Merchants of Venezia specifically has anti Judaic themes. Claven points out it's not anti Semitic themes, right? It's not a racist text. It's just a pro Christian text. And being pro Christian, you have to be anti Judaism. And so that's an interesting contrast to talking about racism in the form of skin color. And finally, there's this third Moor, this third black character called Othello. Let's listen to what Claven says. I'm going to do a bit of a response to Claven here, and I'm going to try my best to subvert this idea that it is a story about racism, that it is the fundamental block from which Shakespeare is trying to carve this story about envy. I don't think that's the case at all. I think it plays, like I said, I think it plays a part. It's a motif, but it isn't integral to the story. And in fact, I believe that the more you perceive it to be a text about racism, the further you get from the core truth of that story. Claven does raise some good points about this abstract concept of blackness that people push, even today, for their own benefits, the way Iago does.、Uh, it's just, I don't, I don't know if I agree that this is what Othello is fundamentally about. And further, I don't even think that Iago is a racist character. That's going to be a fun point. To push forward, that's going to be a fun point to defend. Let's see how well I do it. So let's tune in to what Claven has to say. This is a white man, Iago. Iago is evil, and Iago keeps, is out to destroy the Moor by making him jealous of his white wife, Desdemona. He wants to make him. Othello adores Desdemona. He loves this girl, and he is married to her, and he just adores her, and it drives Iago crazy. Iago, you know, it, there's a lot of question about why Iago hates Othello, and he makes several speeches about it, and he keeps coming back to this thing where he says, I hate the Moor. 
I think he's a racist. I think that Shakespeare was making him a racist. He hates them. He makes a lot of remarks about a black man sleeping with a white woman. He doesn't like that at all. I think he's just trying to destroy the Moor. And what he hates about the Moor is that he thinks he should be an evil guy. He thinks he should be Aaron. He thinks he should be a bad guy because he's black. And he's not. He's not. So Iago tries to turn him into what he thinks a black man is. He tries to turn him into what he thinks a black man is. And the complicated thing about this is that there are things in Othello. He is quick to judge. He is a passionate guy. He's got a, a hot temper. And Iago plays on all these things. And there is a famous scene between the two of them, which always gets me. It's just I find it one of the truly profound uh, moments in the play where Iago is trying to get him to suspect that Cassio is sleeping with his wife. His, his lieutenant Cassio is sleeping with his wife. And he keeps suggesting it and then pulling off. And Othello says to him, spit it out. What are you trying to say? It's cut 31. If thou dost love me, show me thy thought. My lord, you know I love you. I think thou dost. Before I know, thou art full of love and honesty, and wearest thou words before thou givest them breath. Therefore, these stops of thine fright me the more. For such things in a false disloyal knave are tricks of custom. But in a man that's just, they are close dilations working from the heart that passion cannot rule. For Michael Cassio, I dare be sworn, I think that he is honest. I think so too. Men should be what they seem. Or those that be not, would they might seem none. Certain men should be what they seem. Why then, I think Cassio's an honest man. <laughs> you know, Iago has already said, I am not what I am. He says, I am not what I am. But he says, men should be what he seems. Men should be what they seem. And Othello agrees. Men should be what they seem. But they mean two different things because Iago is a villain. Othello means a man should be honest. He should be blunt. He should be bluff. He should say what he has to say. Iago means you, black guy, should act like a black guy and be the villain of this play. <laughs> he is turning him into what he wants him to be. And that is the way racism works. Racism actually does transform cultures into, what they, into the image of what, of what hates them. It turns them into the image of what hates them because it's what they expect from people. It's what they tell them to be. It's what Iago tricks Othello into being. He tells them, he, he tricks him into being jealous, into being passionate, into finally committing murder. And just Okay. Um, so that's quite a lot to pack in, actually. Um, obviously, I disagree with him about why Iago is a racist. I could go through my examples, both those that Clavin uses to assert that he is racist and also why I think he's not. So first of all, a lot of the things that Clavin points out about how Iago behaves is actually him trying to convince other people to go against Othello, right? So for example, um, nearly all of the things that he initially says about a white man and a black woman sleeping together, he is speaking to Desdemona's father, Othello's father-in-law, as it were. The two of them actually elope, Desdemona and Othello elope and marry without her father's consent. And Iago doesn't fan that flame simply by pointing out that she, as the daughter, hasn't followed his will. He also makes it an explicitly racist claim. Hey, your white you is being topped by a black ram. And he says a bunch of other uh, ridiculous stuff um, right in Act 1, Scene 1. So I, because it's so early, I think it's easy to confuse Iago's character as a whole with who, what he says he is in that very initial scene. But the thing is, Iago is constantly saying, I, I am not what I seem. He specifically says, I am not what I am at the end of one of his monologues. So I think Iago is always changing his narrative to best make people believe that he is against Othello. So that they too can sort of follow along in his footsteps and say, oh yes, I'm against Othello just the way Iago is because he's a racist like I am, you see. Um, for example, there's this other character called Roderigo and he's a, he's a mega simp. Right? He thinks he can win Desdemona's favor. He's in love with Desdemona as well, but it's a much more pathetic love, much less manly love than Othello's. And he thinks he can win her over by giving her his wealth. So he gives jewels and he gives riches and he gives all these things to Iago so that Iago can give them to Desdemona and along with those riches, word of Roderigo's love for her. And Iago says, oh, of course I'll put these jewels directly into my bank account. I mean, into her hands. Yes, of course I will do that. Don't you worry. <laughs> but it's to this person, it is to Roderigo, who overvalues wealth, who overvalues status, who overvalues material things, to whom Iago says, I hate the more, I hate Othello, because he denied me the material status that I should have had under him. He, d he denied me a promotion that I ought to have deserved. And Rodrigo buys that. But when it comes to Bramantio, uh, that is Desdemona's father, when it comes to Brabantio, Iago says, hey, by the way, I'm a racist just like you are, and I'm angry about this thing, and you ought to be too. I think that's the story that Iago's weaving. And every time that we as the audience say, oh, Iago's racist, every time we believe him, we are Brabantio. We fall for the same ploy. And every time 
we say, oh, Iago hates Othello because he was passed over for a promotion. We are fooled just as Rodrigo was. We become Rodrigo. And I think that's why these minor characters are here, to say to the audience, hey, don't be like these people. Don't be deceived by Iago in the same way. He hates the Moor, yes. In fact, you know, Iago says as much, but it's not for that reason. And the one time, the one time, as far as I can remember, this is the this is the thing about uh, doing a Shakespeare essay or a Shakespeare video without notes and without having reread in the entirety of Othello, um, and just going off of what one uh, seven hundred year old man is saying in another separate video <laughs> is uh, you can't be certain about the things that you say. But I'm pretty sure the one time that he is all alone and he's discussing why he hates the Moor, he says, "Well, I mean, there is the soliloquy where he says, I hate the Moor." But in that, the only thing he says is, I hate the Moor, how can I destroy him? There is another monologue wherein he says, That Cassio loves her, Desdemona, I do well believe it. That she loves him, and of course this is not a romantic love, but simply a sort of uh, charitable love, right? That she loves him, tis apt and of great credit. The Moor, howbeit that I endure him not, is of a constant, loving, noble nature. And I dare think he'll prove to Desdemona a most dear husband. Now, I do love her too, not out of absolute lust, though peradventure I stand accountant for as great a sin. Right, And I think he's talking here about the seven deadly sins, the seven uh, mortal sins. And he says, well, it's not lust, but I think it is one of these other ones. What could it be? Well, what does he say? But partly led to diet my revenge... For that I do suspect the lusty moor hath leaped into my seat, the thought whereof doth like a poisonous mineral gnaw my inwards. The sin, actually, is envy. And here's the thing that, about envy, is that it's very much like admiration, and it's very much like imitation, which is the, the fruit of admiration, in that you greatly want what this other person has. But in imitation, you try and achieve the means of this other person, right? You try to act like him for the purposes of acting like him. But in envy, you pursue the ends so that you want what he has uh, without, you know, whatever moral qualities that ultimately gave him those fruits in the first place. And following from that, this is what Iago says, nothing can or shall content my soul till I am evened with him, wife for wife, right? So he's saying, I would like Desdemona as my wife, or, uh, you know, he, he has a wife already, but he's saying that she is a much lesser wife than Desdemona is. Or failing so, because obviously Desdemona is already married, and so is Iago for that matter, failing so, yet that I put the Moor at least into a jealousy so strong that judgments cannot cure. He's the, here's the other thing about envy is, if you don't get what the other person has, because he's so much greater than you, for example, you are content, usually, with bringing other people down to where you are. That's the great thing about envy, you see, because it's solely about the ends. You don't really care if you achieve his aims or if he collapses down to your aims. So I think this is why he hates the Moor, because he recognizes that the Moor is great. The Moor is great. And because he is great, he ought not have it. And you might be saying, well, okay, but that's still a pretty big leap. Like, why doesn't he want the Moor specifically to have it? I mean, he's not envious of the Duke of Venice, for example. He isn't envious of anybody else. But he specifically wants to destroy the Moor. Is it because of his skin color? To which I would say, yes and... <laughs> yes and classic. Because I think it's not his skin color specifically. It's not, uh, as Clavin says, it's not the fact that... Iago expects all black people to act a certain way, and so it's frustrating for him when he realizes that Othello doesn't act that way. Rather, it's simply the fact that he is not a Venetian. Rather, it's simply the fact that he is an outsider in the first place, that he could be given something of great value to the Venetian state. I think that's ultimately what winds Iago up so much. You know, this Venetian beauty, I think, th I think this is his fundamental claim is not that black people ought to act like black people, which is what Clavin says, but rather that Venetian things ought to belong to the Venetian people. You'll notice that's not really racism, right? Racism is this belief that one group of people are lesser than the other. But this principle that what started out outside ought to remain outside is, I think, what ultimately drives so much of Iago's wrath 
and Iago's envy. See here what he says, hath leaped into my seat, right? So he's taken something that doesn't belong to him in the first place. The thought whereof doth like a poisonous mineral gnaw my inwards. So that's the fundamental claim that I want to make about Iago. He's not a racist. Rather, he will say anything he needs to to convince other people, A, of his hatred against the outsider, and B, to fuel that same hatred in them in just the same way. So Brabantio, for example, seeing Iago's racism is fueled into his own racism. Here's the interesting thing about Brabantio. He actually likes Othello, apparently. He says uh, uh, Othello uh, testifies that the reason he married Desdemona was because he spent so much time in Brabantio's house just ex just telling him these stories of his exploits. And the way the two of them fell in love was that Desdemona uh, frequently came to listen to his stories alongside her father. So, you know, this person who otherwise acts in a very non-racist way is fueled into a racism by Iago's words and Iago's display of blatant anti-black bigotry. And in the same way, it's Roderigo, right, who maybe would have been just a, a, a normal simp until eventually Desdemona got married. But it is through Iago stoking the fires in him that he literally sells his house just to give Desdemona more money so that he doesn't have to give up on her. I think that's what Iago's role is. Now, if you're, if you're, if you're awake, let's say, if you've been paying attention, this, I think this, this, this really ought to remind you of someone or rather something. And this ties into sort of Iago's omnipresence, right? He's in every single scene. He's always whispering one thing to one person and another thing to another person, whatever they want to hear in the way that most benefits Iago. He will lie if it benefits him. He will tell the truth if it benefits him. He will twist words to twist people's minds. Even in the same scene, he will choose one set of beliefs for one person and then switch over and be a completely different person to another, almost like Iago. Iago doesn't actually belong in the real world, but is simply sitting on the shoulders of every single character, whispering to them exactly what they want to hear, not for their benefit, oh no, but for his own. Does that remind you of anyone? I am speaking, of course, of the devil. This is very interesting because the devil is constantly, constantly referenced throughout Othello. And in fact, his wife is the first one to recognize, hey, there is a demon who is convincing people certain wrong things. And whoever he is, he is out to win something for himself. And Iago listens to this and he goes, no, that's ridiculous. What are you talking about? <laughs> but I think that's exactly what it is. And Clavin mentions this scene, right, where he says, men should be what they seem. But it's the second part of that sentence that Iago says that is really important. Let me quickly find it on my copy of... Men should, uh, men should be what they seem, or, Iago continues, or those that be not, would they might seem none. Clavin says Iago self-references his own psyche in the first part. Now, like I said, Iago, of course, he says, I am not what I am. Um, and I think he's saying that to himself as well. You know, I, I will say whatever I need, whatever needs saying. Um, that's that's his perspective. Meanwhile, on the other side, Othello's perspective of that statement is, yeah, certainly men should be what they seem. They should say what they believe and they should be honest and they should be forthright, which is, of course, ironic. Firstly, because everyone keeps saying that Iago is the most honest person in the play when he's not. And secondly, because Iago himself isn't capable of spitting out this lie, right? That Cassio is sleeping with Othello's wife. And Othello is like, yeah, you should just be honest and come out with it. Men should be what they seem. But it's the second line that I want to talk about. Or those that be not, would they might seem none. And I think this, more than anything, is what Iago, is how Iago wants to describe himself. I don't think he sees himself as a man. I think he fully recognizes that he is possessed by something demonic, let's say, or possessed by this sin of envy. First of all, he identifies it correctly, right? He says, I am possessed not of lust, but of a sin with equal gravity. But also he's saying, look, I don't even really want to be this man stuck with trying to uh, appear honest and do my best to convince. No, I want to be the pure manifestation of the thought that tells you to be envious, to be jealous, to be wrathful, right? I want to be nothing more than that. Would that I might seem not to be a man at all, but simply what I am, the thoughts that a devil would bring to your mind when you least expect it, when you least want to hear. 
All of these are tied together to show that Iago isn't a racist at all. In fact, he's much worse. He's the devil. He's this ugly spirit that sits in everyone's heart and whispers to them the worst things that they want to hear. What the hell does that mean? They want to hear bad things? Yes, sometimes you do. Sometimes the worst thing you can hear is the truth, and Iago will be more than happy to tell you the truth at those times. And sometimes the things you are most afraid of hearing are the things you want, much like Othello found out, the things you are most afraid of hearing are the things that you most want to uh, become realized. We already talked about Brabantio hearing that thing that he doesn't want to hear, which is that a black guy is having sex with his white daughter, and he's like, ah, ah, right? Um, <laughs> that's a dramatization. And then we hear from Rodrigo as well that uh, despite all the money that he's been throwing at her, Desdemona is still denying him. That's the one thing he doesn't want to hear. Both of those things come from Iago. So again, the voice of the devil speaking of things you most want to hear for the worst possible reasons. A better example is Othello. Othello falls for this trap, as we see with the handkerchief, right? Like, he can't see for himself that, yes, his wife loves him, but instead he focuses on the handkerchief, right? No matter what Desdemona says, Othello goes, where is the handkerchief? Where is the handkerchief? Where is the, where is the handkerchief? Where is the handkerchief? Until eventually he hits her, because she can't provide a satisfactory response, even though she has been constantly saying, look, I love you, and you don't need to be skeptical. You don't need to be paranoid about this situation. Uh, I'm just, I just controlled, control F'd, if that's a verb. I just searched through the entire, <laughs> that's better. I just searched through the entirety of Othello and I'm counting the number of devils and I've already passed more than a dozen. Unlike, for example, Macbeth or Hamlet or even Lear, where there are supernatural elements that are, if not directly visible, then at least referenced verbally, there are very few supernatural references in Othello. And the only one that pops up repeatedly over and over and over again is this word, devil. Cassio actually mentions the devil uh, three times in a very short path, just after being completely manipulated by Iago into being um, kicked out of his post. Cassio is sort of Othello's second in command, the position for which Iago was passed over, right? Cassio says, it hath pleased the devil, drunkenness, to give place to the devil, wrath. And he's saying this to Iago, not knowing that both those devils, drunkenness and wrath, were derived from the devil himself, which speaks now directly to him. And moreover, Cassio says, every inordinate cup is unblessed. Cup being, I suppose, a metaphor for a man, right? A man succumbing to temptations or opening his ears to the devil's whispers. Every inordinate cup is unblessed and the ingredient is a devil. So you take your ordinary man, you take even a heroic man, like Othello, and you place in it a drop of the devil, and you get a tragedy. You get the tragedy of Othello. That's genuinely what I believe. Right at the very end, Othello looks at Iago himself and says, if that thou beest a devil, I cannot kill thee. And he stabs Iago. And what happens? Iago doesn't die. Iago is only wounded. I bleed, sir, but not killed, says Iago. Uh, and I think it is important that in a tragedy, a Shakespearean tragedy, where usually everyone dies, the devil survives. The devil survives. Because, obviously, you can't, you can't kill the devil. I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, maybe you've tried, but you can't kill the devil. The point, rather, is that it's not Othello's to kill. If there is an Iago that resides in all of our hearts, as there is, then it is up to us to, well, to wound him, at least. But to kill him is our duty, Ultimately, Othello cannot kill it for us. A few lines down also, Othello asks, Will you, I pray, demand that demi-devil why he hath thus ensnared my soul and body? And Iago says, Demand me nothing. What you know, you know. <laughs> From this time forth, I never will speak word. Iago and all the other names that the devil has, the great deceiver, Diablo, which literally means divider, who divides people, as Othello was divided from his wife, Desdemona, or Desdemona, as people actually pronounce her name, <laughs> um, Prince of Lies. Iago is defeated in the sense that he stops speaking and he cannot deceive you anymore. And that's the great thing about the word deception, right? Like, you can deceive in many ways, not simply by lying. In fact, you can deceive by telling the truth to a certain person at a certain time. 
oh, by the way, I saw Cassio had that handkerchief. And lo, Cassio does have the handkerchief. But how? Ah, Iago put it into his pocket. So the devil is defeated, but he does not die. And all we are are the playthings for these supernatural entities that devise to destroy us. And for what reason, really, besides envy? You know, Satan, in a sort of classical Christian sense, he envied humanity and the free will that God gave us. And that's why Lucifer rebelled against God. In much the same way that Satan believes that humans are outsiders to our spiritual selves, right? That we are but animals in just the same way. Iago believes that the Moor is not supposed to have this Venetian recognition. He's not supposed to have a Venetian wife or a Venetian life. He's simply supposed to be the Moor. And, you know, if we want to take on this racist perspective, then yes, he wants the Moor to remain animalistic. But I think, again, it's not about race. It's about this more spiritual sin of envy that Iago has for anyone who is an outsider, for anyone who he deems doesn't deserve being accepted into the Venetian state. Okay, so that was quite a long discussion. Let's go back to what Clavin has to say. To finally committing murder. And just before Othello murders Desdemona for an infidelity she didn't commit, we find her singing a song that was taught to her by a maid named Barbary, which is where the Moors come from. So it's as if, Here's, here's Othello, who is a, an assimilationist. He's become a Christian. We think he probably was a Muslim to begin with, but now he's become a Christian. He's fighting for Venice. He's fighting for white people. He considers himself a leader among men, a leader among these people. He considers himself one of them. He has done the state service, right? And now his wife is singing this Moorish tune as if he has turned her into him instead of him becoming what he wants to be, which is a respected warrior in Venice. And the last moment when Othello realizes he has done Desdemona wrong, that he has killed her unfairly, the woman that he loved, he kills himself. Othello, you know, it's a Shakespearean tragedy. Everybody ends up dead. But before he kills himself, he says, in Aleppo once, where a malignant and turbaned Turk, a Muslim, beat a Venetian and traduced the state, I took by the throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus, and he stabs himself. And the implication is, is that somewhere in Othello was still this Muslim guy, who tried to convert, tried to become a Venetian, tried to stand up for Venice, and now in killing that Moor, he has to that Muslim, he has to kill himself. Iago turns him into this person. Iago will not let him become the Venetian warrior he wants to be. When I called my piece for City Journal a nation of Iagos, what I meant is I feel like the left is doing the same thing to black people. When you put up George Floyd as a hero, when you put up Dante Wright as a victim, instead of telling people, hey, guess what? You could be like Clarence Thomas. You could be like Thomas Sowell. You could be among the great intellectuals, the great judges, the great athletes, the great musicians of this country. So many great things that black people in this country have aspired to in tougher times than these and achieved. But the left keeps saying, no, no, no. You should be what you've seen. You should be what you've seen. We think of you as criminals. We think of George Floyd as the typical black guy. We think of the criminals in your neighborhood as the typical people, the people that you should look up to. We are living in a nation of Iagos. You are defined by your ideas. Are there racial traits? Probably. Probably. DNA is a powerful thing. We probably all have some traits, good and bad. We all have traits that have the potential for being good or bad, but we are God-made men and women, and you know that there's a potential to turn whatever traits we have to the good, to the better. And the left just keeps inspiring blacks to be the worst that they can be. It is a shame. It's a crime. The left is the worst thing. The Democrats truly are the worst thing that ever happened to black Americans, and we're seeing that full unfold on the streets of our cities and we're seeing it unfold in the riots that are taking place and have been taking place since last summer okay so the uh, honestly a a really acute analysis by clavin there i think he's pretty much dead on with all the racial dynamics uh, and how race has been used to manipulate people and to really bring out the worst in a a certain kind of belief i don't want to say a certain kind of people because that's outrageously wrong uh, 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 and in fact, it's exactly what they want you to believe, the way Clavin says. It's the worst of a certain kind of belief. Much like Iago, it is the expression of envy. You say, oh, a black person doesn't have the things that a white person has, not because of, you know, the societal policies that were brought up in the 60s that specifically targeted people of a certain demographic in this way. Not only because we have culturally made victimhood a virtue, So that just to get into a victim group, we will gladly put ourselves into uh, ridiculous and demeaning social groups, such as, for example, people of color, which I don't, I don't know about you, but I think Othello (laughs) would have been very violently against that, as am I for that matter, just to perceive ourselves as virtuous against a certain other demographic, namely white people. It's not those, you know, cultural and political problems which demean the name of success to the people who need the most. Uh, Instead, it is simply that, oh, we live in a white supremacist country. Oh yeah, that's what it is. And even if the people who succeed aren't all white, it's because they have an inbuilt white supremacy in them. It's just a a completely ridiculous daydreaming fueled by the envy of success. 
And again, remember, envy is the pursuit of the ends. Because as all good envy does, the people who admire the means, right, they are the ones who are demonized as following white supremacy or whatever whatever stupid name they give it nowadays. Fucking just retarded. Fuck. Now, there's a couple of things I still want to mention with Othello. The first is, as Clavin mentioned, the very, very ending. When Othello is talking about this person he killed, this uh, Muslim, Muslim, <laughs> as, as the old school pronunciation is, M-O-S-L-E-M, Muslim. But no, Muslim. He kills this Turk at the start, and I'm trying to find it now, but I can't. In Aleppo once, where a malignant and a turbaned Turk beat a Venetian and traduced the state, I took by the throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus. So he's saying he killed this Muslim man for traducing the state, for insulting the state of Venice, and for beating a Venetian. Now, Clavin says that he's sort of calling himself back to his Muslim roots. Like, he's saying, just as I killed this Venetian who once upon a time insulted Venice, so too have I insulted Venice by killing and destroying these uh, products of Venetian beauty, right? Like my wife and this post, this office that I've been granted has been completely dishonored. And that's one method of thinking about it. But what I think is, and my head, this goes back to a headcanon that I have about this story that Othello shares. Um, So take it with a grain of salt. It's not, you know, (laughs) it's not uh, scholastically sound, Let's say it's it's not a scholarly theory, but essentially the reason why this story stands out to Othello so much is because this is how he was first um, brought to the attention of the Venetian public, let's say, that he saved um, this Venetian man from being beat up, that he killed a Muslim who was insulting the Venetian state. And this was what propelled him into the position that he is in today. And it is by returning to that point where he first became a Venetian that he has to rescind it right it's it's only by that same pathway that he has to rescind it what that means is i think he's he's rescinding his venetian status by saying that he never really deserved it in the first place and if i killed that turk and got this uh everything that i have in my life so far then i never should have had it in the first place and i should have smote myself in just the same way back then and now now that everything's gone wrong Only now do I have the opportunity to do it correctly. I think that's really what he's saying. And the reason I believe that is because, you know, a lot of people say that Othello keeps returning to his Moorish roots, that the reason he killed his wife was because he felt this need for a honor killing because he had this Muslim heritage in him that was sort of bubbling back out. I don't believe that at all. I think he really did have this full Christian conversion, this full Venetian conversion, and his flaws are not him falling back to his Moorish, Moorishness at all, but that's simply the way Iago wants us to perceive it. So again, we are being deceived by Iago, even though we are the audience members. I fundamentally reject that this is a play based on racism. Rather, it's a play based on this spiritual battle between a, a man trying to be Venetian, right? A man trying to be holy and, and uh, beautiful, Um, Not that Venice is itself beauty, but rather because he aspires to be Venetian, it manifests as his own personal heaven to him. And on the other hand, the Satan figure that sits on his shoulder and just keeps whispering uh, the the path back down to uh, deny him Venice, as it were. And for me, what I see there is someone who realized that because he is flawed as a human being, because he is corrupt... Because he has these unbridled sins, right, uh, rampaging through his body at all times, because he is bound by this material world, he can never actually attain heaven in a correct way. And this idea of attaining heaven, obviously those of you guys who've been uh, watching my channel for a long time will be familiar with. But it will be very familiar also to anyone who's read Othello because nearly the entire last scene is a bunch of people saying, have you said your prayers because you're about to go to heaven? That's in fact one of the last things that Othello says to his wife uh, before he kills her. And so for him to say, I I despair of my ability to go to heaven, therefore I will kill myself, is I think a success of the devil. I think the real moment this became the tragedy of Othello and not just the villainy of Iago and how he was brought to justice, right? The, re- the reason it's not that play and the reason it's the tragedy of Othello is because he finally comes to believe what Iago has said about him all along, which is, you don't deserve Venice. You don't deserve Venice. You don't deserve heaven. It's interesting also that uh, Iago's wife, Emilia, who 
like I said, is the antagonist to Iago. She's the only one who discovers Iago's plan. And she is so single-handedly the one who brings Iago to justice, who says, hey, this is the guy who made me steal Cassio's handkerchief. This is all his doing. You've been duped. I'm sorry my mistress is dead. I'm sorry Desdemona is dead. But I can do this. I can do this against the devil. Bring that man to justice. So she does. So she becomes the antagonist to the protagonist of the play, Iago. But uh, this one scene without Iago in it that I talked about at the start, in it, she is talking to Desdemona about the material world. Uh, They have this conversation about what would you do if you could have the world, right? And this, of course, is a reference to Gospels where Jesus says, um, what does he say? Hang on, let me look this up. (laughs) This uh, this was also quoted in the Beatles song, Within You, Without You, so I'm just going to sing that song instead. We were talking about the love that's gone so cold And the people who gain the world and lose their soul They don't know, they can't see Are you one of them? What shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul. They have this conversation about if your husband could have the world, then would you give up your soul? And Desdemona says, obviously not. So we, we see the kind of heroine she is. But Amelia says, yeah, I mean, my husband, I, I'd do anything to give him the world, even if it was adultery, which is what Desdemona is being accused by, accused of by Othello. She says this, why the wrong is but a wrong in the world. And having the world for your labor, tis a wrong in your own world, and you might quickly make it right. Do you see the flaw there? The flaw is the fatal failure to recognize the spiritual domain wherein Iago exists, wherein the devil is always waiting for his opportunity to destroy you in his envy, in his wrath. In Climax, then, I think what Shakespeare is saying is it is at your own peril that you deny the devil. Because though he may not have horns and hooves, and though he may not sit in your actual heart, though he may not sit on your shoulder, though he may not have very strong whispers, he is around. He is around. And worse, he is in people. He is in Iagos, who will do, who will say what they need, who will deceive you in just the way they please, to make themselves the beneficiaries of your suffering, to give themselves the advantage over the world so that they can pretend to master over it, not recognizing that they themselves have made a demon out of their spirits. And just as Clavin points out, it is these precise demons, the very same ones, it's a nation of Iagos, as Clavin says, that are creating these Black Lives Matter protests and riots, all based on a very flawed ideology and one very grave sin. This is ultimately why Iago succeeds, though he is caught, because... Even his antagonist, right, the one person who was supposed to fight against him, actually agrees with him that there is no spiritual realm, that you can do whatever you want in this world for the sake of the world, and not for the sake of heaven, for the sake of Venice, for the sake of some greater thing. And that ultimately is why Iago succeeds in killing Desdemona, and that's ultimately why the devil succeeds in claiming Othello's soul. Well, so those are the main points I wanted to discuss with Othello. Obviously, there's a a lot more to talk about. I mean, it's Shakespeare. You could virtually look at every single line, every single word, and maybe write an essay on each. So I'm not going to do that. This is just what I think is wrong about a sort of gullible interpretation of Iago, where you simply look at what he says and say, ah, yes, this this is Iago. It's like, no, 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 no. That's exactly what he wants you to do. But he is never those things that he says he is. Uh, to the point that when he says he hates the Moor, you don't know whether he's saying, do I hate Moorness? Do I hate the fact that he is a Moor? Does he hate something about the Moor's character? Does he hate something about the Moor's status? It's like, does he even hate the Moor? Does he, in fact, admire the Moor? It's just like I said, the difference at the start between imitation and envy, instead of admiring him for his good works, he admires only the ends that he has achieved and wants them for himself. There is, I think, nothing like Othello, especially I think someone like me, you know, an immigrant who, not by choice, but by circumstance, 
every single relationship I've been in has been interracial. In fact, it's better to describe it as international, because unlike Othello moving to Venice, right, and marrying a Venetian, when everyone gets funneled into Canada from all over the world, you lose those cultural divisions. People call it a melting pot. I think rather it's sort of like a sieve or a filter where everything sort of unique about those cultures gets filtered out and you get sort of a gray slush at the bottom where everyone has sort of a the cheapest possible version of their original culture. And it's from there that you get an interracial relationship. But because it is all so vague and undefined, uh, the, the best that you can describe it as is international relationship. And the, the initial cultures that were there just don't factor into it at all. Clavin has that point, for example, where Othello is trying so hard to make himself a Venetian. But his wife, on the other hand, has learned this Moorish song that she has become more like him in his efforts to be more like her. You know, they've sort of swapped places for the love for each other. And who knows, maybe that too was one of the sparks of Iago's envy. The fact that someone could sacrifice their Venetianness in the first place for the sake of moorness, um, that someone would step out of that place for the sake of someone else, right? So that, that someone could be so deeply in love, which I don't think Iago, I don't think Iago knows that kind of love could even have existed. And there, there, I think, is probably the deepest envy. The envy of, you know, agape love, completely self-sacrificing love. I think it's a mark of Shakespeare's genius that he never actually does give us that concrete definition of why Iago hates the Moor. And I think it's because he wants us to say that Iago exists on a spiritual level where he sees everything all at once. Not only is he omnipresent throughout the text in that he's in every scene, but also he is omniscient. And that he sees all these different parts of the characters that we are only revealed to very slowly at a time. So that when we learn this little fact about Desdemona, we can almost assume that Iago knows it as well. I think that's exactly why at the very end, what's the very last thing Iago says? Everything I have to say, you already know. Because everything he knows comes from everything you know in the first place, right? He has that omniscience, that uh, divine spiritual omniscience. Um, that you would only expect from either God or the devil, you see. So yes, that's that's some good rambling. I'm going to go edit this. You'll probably hear the quality of my mic change like 20 different times over the course of this video as I listen to what I say and realize, no, that's not. I, I completely messed that point up. I'm going to re-record it. Hopefully that doesn't happen too much, though. If you enjoy this video, I don't think I'll make many more like it. So... <laughs> so uh, uh, contribute your own thoughts I'll try and see whether something like this uh, is something I can do often if you guys enjoyed it but if not then whatever I'll just go back to making audiobooks or something this was supposed to be a amble as I call them now or a mic test as they used to be called uh, and all of this so far was supposed to be a pre-amble and I was going to read one of Iago's monologues because I really, really, really like Iago. In fact, I would say I'm more like Iago than I am Othello. More like the devil. As I think all of us are, though we would fright ourselves to admit it. We are more like the devil than we would like to admit. Not to mention, of course, the fact that he's possibly the best villain ever written, right? Like, uh, I don't know, give me your favorite villain. Scar from Lion King? Ah, child's play, literally. Nothing on Iago. But ultimately, this video has been going on too long, so I won't, I won't give you a Shakespeare performance. This will just go into my other thoughts playlist, where I just sort of throw all these other thoughts <laughs> that, I, that I have that don't really fit anywhere else on my channel. So, let me know what you think. Don't listen to the devil. Don't be beguiled. Don't be gullible. Stay mortal. Don't be jump-scared by death. That's more Hamlet than Othello, to be honest. But whatever, it's my standard outro now, so I'll just go with it. Stay mortal, don't be jump-scared by death, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.